So I will take first, uh, instead of Venerable, I will take one uh, Tibetan tradition, uh, Venerable Changba, uh, Changchuk Penzok. Uh, let me say, can you introduce briefly who you are uh, and your background? I should say this at the beginning. I forgot that. Uh, my apology. Uh, give a brief description, you know, uh, description of yourself and your background. Then start. So you have 15 <coughs> minutes. It's now uh, five to one. Homage to the three jewels, um, and I pay respect to all the sangha members who are here today. And um, I feel extremely fortunate to be sitting in the gathering of both Tibetan and. Um, people from the Thai tradition sitting together and having conversation together and I feel it's extremely fortunate and due to the kindness of His Holiness the Dalai Lama that we are here today. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Janju Punzo and I was born in Israel and I've been a monk for 22 years. I've been studying in a monastery in Ganden since 2000. Um, and now, um, so when His Holiness spoke yesterday about the Chibitakayan short, he, he uh, mentioned that from the Vinaya point of view, we are all exactly the same. Um, from the uh, Sutra, Sutra Pitaka, we are also very similar and also we have a lot of common with the non-Buddhist traditions. But when we talk about the Abhidhamma Pitaka, that is where we will find some uh, slight differences in the Pali tradition and in the Sanskrit tradition. And specifically that within the Sanskrit tradition, we are following the Nalanda tradition. So mainly our focus is on the development of logic and not so much following of the um, <coughs> quotations from the sutras, but more the logical um, development. So. When my topic is to speak about um, pratidya samutpat or uh, dependent, origin dependent origination, in the Sanskrit tradition, in the Nalanda tradition, I only have a very short time to talk, and it is a very elaborate topic. So I made a, a short division. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> I, I wanted to... Um, uh, show how important this topic is. So when all the great Nalanda masters, when they speak even in their homage, um, in the beginning of their text, they use the dependent origination. If you look at page 51, that is where uh, I began my article. So you can see Nagarjuna uh, gave the uh, praise to dependent origination and also when His Holiness the Dalai Lama goes to the West and he gives introduction to Buddhism, he summarizes all of Buddhism into two topics. The Buddhist conduct is nonviolence, and the Buddhist view is dependent origination or Pratitya Samutpad. Now they use the topic Pratitya Samutpad as the Buddhist view and they don't use Anatta. They don't speak about selflessness. They speak about dependent origination for a very important reason. It's because through the understanding of, sorry, through the understanding of dependent origination, we can avoid the two extremes, the extreme of non-existence and the extreme of existence. Now, all of the traditions accept Pratitya Samutpad, but Pratitya Samutpad has Pratitya Samutpad has a few levels of subtlety. So I will just speak about each of them in a very brief manner. The first level is what we call <coughs> the dependent origination or Pratitya Samutpad of arising independence on causes and conditions um, or what we call anita or uh, impermanence, okay? So dependent origination, there are two words, the dependent or pratitya and samutpad, meaning everything is dependent and it originates. The dependent and, um, stops us from falling into the extreme of uh, true existence. 
the origination or the samutpad stops us from falling to the extreme of non-existence, okay? Now, the first one, dependence upon causes and conditions, means all impermanent phenomena, all conditioned phenomena, arise in dependence on causes and conditions. In this level of, uh, of dependent origination, we can understand, like in the Rice Seedling Sutra, um, the Buddha talked about the 12 links of dependent origination. Here comes the 12 links of dependent or origination, the karma, cause and effect, uh, rebirth, the lower realms and higher realms, all of these explanations come here in the um, dependent origination, dependence upon causes and conditions. So all impermanent phenomena, all compos composite phenomena are impermanent. So this is common between the Pali and the Sanskrit tradition. I don't want to elaborate too much on this topic, um, but mainly the most important, there are three conditions. First, the unmovable condition means that all composite phenomena, they do not arise from a creator. God did not create phenomena. They were created by causes and conditions. The second one is the impermanent condition, meaning not only did they arise independent on causes and conditions, but these causes and conditions are impermanent. They are momentarily changing. And the third condition is what we call capable condition, meaning not only do all composite phenomena arise in dependence upon impermanent causes and conditions, but these, they only arise um, on the certain conditions that are capable of creating them. So not all causes create all results, but only specific causes can create specific results. So these are the three conditions. Now the second, um, uh, the second uh, level of dependent origination and the third, they are very similar, so I'll talk about them uh, together, is the dependent origination that in dependence upon parts or basis of imputation. So for example, the person, the person is, the person is a, a dependent origination since not only is he created from causes and conditions, he is also um, arises independent on the parts which are the skandhas, the five aggregates. Um, so he is labeled independence upon the skandhas. He also arises and depend upon uh, the skandhas. And like that, all impermanent, uh, impermanent phenomena also arise independent upon the basis of imputation. So there is a basis, and on top of that, um, we impute. Um, so I won't go too much into this since we don't have too much time. So this is the second and the third. The difference between the second and the third is one is necessarily impermanent and one is also non-impermanent phenomena like the space. Space is also dependent upon its basis of imputation. Um, the fourth level of dependent origination is a dependent origination that is only explained in the Sanskrit tradition. So you will not find this in the Pali tradition. Um, we talk, you will find this explanation very elaborate in Nagarjuna's teaching. Um, in the Nalanda tradition of Nagarjuna and um, uh, Buddha Palita and Chandrakirti and so forth, they speak about this level, these two levels of dependent origination. So the fourth level dependent, if you look on page 54, uh, dependent origination of mutual dependence. So this, for example, first of all, the understanding of this level of, of uh, dependent origination or pradita samutpad is dependent upon the understanding that phenomena have no inherent existence. Okay, so for example, the mountain over there and the mountain here are mutually dependent on each other. How is this? Because the label here and the label there are dependent on each other. Without here, there is no there. Without there, there is no here. 
and therefore when we say the mountain here, it is necessarily dependent on there in order for us to be able to label. So because there is no inherent existence within the mountain itself, the actual nature of the mountain here is dependent on the mountain there, and so on with, for example, tasty and not tasty, tall and short, um, beautiful and ugly. All these are mutually dependent on each other. These are all imputed, merely, Im merely imputed by the mind, and therefore the existence of ugly is dependent upon the existence of beautiful. The existence of tall is dependent upon the existence of short and so forth. So this is a more subtle level of pratidya samutpad or dependent origination. Um, <clears throat> so the, I won't go into the questions answer here. I will go into the last and most subtle level of the pratidya samutpad, um, which is the uh, dependent origination of being merely labeled by a conceptual mind. Now this is the most subtle um, level of, of dependent origination, meaning that all phenomena have no existence from their own side. When you search within the actual phenomena, you cannot find it. It is only imputed by a conceptual mind. So everything is dependent on the conceptual mind that is imputing it, or the conceptual mind that is giving it a name. So here, for example, I quoted from a sutra, and um, Nagarjuna, in his Root Wisdom, on page 56, you can see, whatever is dependently related origination, that is said to be emptiness. That is dependently imputed. This is the middle way path. Because there are not any phenomena that are not dependent origination, for this reason, there are not any phenomena that are not empty. So the understanding of anatman, or anatta, and the understanding of dependent origination are very much dependent on each other. The understanding that dependent origination is the subtle, conventional reality that one understands after you understand anatma. So here there is a very interesting debate within the Nalanda tradition that can help us understand this level of dependent origination. The debate came between three great masters, Buddha Palita, Baba Viveka, and Chandrakirti. The three masters, first Baba Viveka in his text, uh, sorry, Buddha Palita in his text, Buddha Palita explained this level of dependent yeah. origination. Yeah, two minutes okay. to conclude. So he explained that everything is dependent upon being imputed by a conceptual mind merely being imputed, meaning there is nothing from its own side. So Baba Viveka asked him, if this is true, then we can impute everything on anything. We can say that a pillar is a pot, and a pot is a pillar, because from their own side, there is no pot and no pillar. So we can say a pillar is a pot, and it will become a pot. This is his debate to Buddha Palita. And the answer came from uh, Chandrakirti. And Chandrakirti answered in his clear words, he answered, he said, it is true that you could um, impute anything on anything, but for this to be a proper imputation, there must be no other um, valid conventional mind that can refute this. So when you impute a pillar on, on the top of a vase, on the basis of a vase, that can be harmed by the valid cognition that understands that this is a pillar. So this is not a, a proper imputation. So this is the understanding of how things are imputed and how they are not existent from their own side is very well understood through this debate. So uh, I will finish here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Venerable Changju Pundok. And uh, Venerable Changju Punjo has uh, touched on what His Holiness had said yesterday morning about uh, what are the similarities between the two traditions, uh, Pali tradition and uh, Sanskrit tradition. 
you know, uh, similarities are in the Vinaya and the uh, uh, Sutta, but uh, there are some differences in the Abhidharma. And then, as you can see in the, you know, his uh, paper, he you know, had a quite detailed explanation about the, the meaning of the uh, uh, dependent origination, but it is some part of and uh, he explained there are you know, four levels of interpretation on that topic, dependent origination. And he said uh, the first three, there are, uh, there are common interpretation between the Theravadan and the Mahana, but uh, the last one, uh, which uh, he explained is quite unique in the, Therav in the Mahana tradition, or Sanskrit tradition, and also there's a nice uh, brief you know, the, uh, debate which took place you know, over maybe three, four, five hundred years uh, between the, uh, some of the great Nalanda masters uh, on the understanding of subtlety of the dependent origination, particularly the meaning of you know, the mere imputation. And that's uh, how he concluded. Thank you very much, Venerable. In the Buddhist tradition, we have the venerable monks have a lot of knowledge. It's a really wonderful thing. You know, that's the only way to get enlightened, things like that. But in terms of outreaching the society, there's not much. And in some countries, it is now happening that people are really saying that monks come, give teaching, take money, take food, and go away, do nothing. So they turn to Christianity. This is happening in many places I visited. So this is for me a big concern. And in fact, recently I was reading something very interesting where he says, ignorance is not the root cause of suffering, inaction is the root cause of suffering. <laughs> so can you please elaborate on this and you know how important it is, I need to know your view. Yeah, Venerable, can, can you have a brief comment? Yes, 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 please. Um, I agree with what Geshe-la um, Geshe Geshe says about um, this problem, but specifically in my specific situation is a little bit different than most of the monks. Mm. Since I come from a Western country and I am supporting myself, so that's, what I'm, that's why I didn't want to answer the question initially, <laughs> because <laughs> my situation is different. Um, but I agree with geshe -la and I see and I think that it's very important to engage the monks in the community. So they first must study themselves and understand the teaching. And then within the monastery, they should be sent out into the community to understand um, the community that they live in and to be able to teach according to the different disciples that they live in the community. I think it's a very important um, activity, as Geshe-la has mentioned. Okay, now I'll open the door. Yeah. Thank you, geshe uh, So my question is for uh, the second speaker, geshe, uh, Venerable Changchu Punzola. Uh, Venerable, uh, I'm quite happy that uh, you mentioned about ahimsa, non-violence, which uh, nowadays we hardly got to hear uh, in seminars and conferences uh, on Buddhism. Uh, so my question is, what is the relation between Pratitta Samutpada, dependent origination, and Ahimsa <coughs> non-violence? And what is the ultimate distinguishing factor of a right conduct and wrong conduct? Thank you very much for your question. Um, I mentioned ahimsa um, for a reason. Um, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he gives introduction to Buddhism talks in the West, he summarizes the whole of the Buddh Buddhism into two. Conduct or conduct, which is ahimsa, and view, which is dependent origination. That's how he summarizes all of Buddhism into these two. Conduct is ahimsa or nonviolence. 
So if you want to summarize all of Buddhism in these two, conduct and view, you would summarize into ahimsa and dependent origination. But of course, they are connected to each other. Um, as I explained before, dependent origination comes to all levels of explanations within the Buddhist, Buddhism. And karma is also connected to um, dependent origination. Love and compassion is connected to dependent origination. There is no level of uh, explanation within Buddhism that is not connected to dependent origination. And this is also connected to your second question, which is um, how do you define good or positive action to negative action? So actually, these are defined by the result, which is something that we cannot always see. It is more defined by the motivation than the physical and verbal action. Um, if the motivation is negative, even if it seems positive, the result will be negative. So it's a negative action. So whether it's negative or positive depends on the motivation. It depends on, the, we define it through the result of that action.